Hey there tech fans, Rick here again from the O-Ray team. In today's video, I'd like to pass along a few troubleshooting tips and best practices to help you avoid some of the common pitfalls you may encounter when installing an HDMI extension kit. Now these kits are incredibly easy to install as long as you're aware of certain specifications and cable types that you may need to use to finish the installation. But before I get too deep into the troubleshooting tips, I thought I'd start off with a really basic understanding of how an HDMI extension kit works. So with any HDMI extension kit, you'll find a transmitter module and at least one receiver module. Some kits have multiple receiver modules, but essentially one transmitter and one receiver. The transmitter module is located at the primary site where you're enjoying the content today that you'd like to share with the remote location. The remote receiver is at that secondary site where you'd like to enjoy that content. And then there's a connection between the two. Now I've got a LAN version right here, so you can see a LAN cable between the two, but if it's a longer distance or higher resolution, that may be a fiber optic cable, or if they're closer together with lower resolution, maybe it's a wireless connection between the two. But either way, there's some connection between the transmitter and the receiver unit. For today's discussion, I'm gonna talk about it from a LAN perspective. The other connection you'll need to make is an HDMI connection between the transmitter module and your media device, and the receiver module in your monitor. So that's where I'll start because a lot of the problems that customers encounter have to do with the connections between the transmitter and receiver modules and either the media device or the monitor. And that HDMI cable is super important that you get the right type of cable and the right certification of the cable. So with HDMI cables, there are really two certifications that you need to be aware of, HDMI 1.4 compliance and HDMI 2.0 or 2.1 compliance. And typically, if you're transmitting 1080p content, HDMI 1.4 is perfectly fine. But instead, if you're transmitting 4K or 8K content, you'll want to have at least an HDMI 2.0 or 2.1 cable. Now, they look very similar. I've got two cables right here. This one is an HDMI 1.4 cable, and this one is an HDMI 2.1 cable. So you wouldn't really know the difference by looking at them, but when you buy the cables, there are certification standards that you'll find for the cables that you're purchasing. One other thing you may want to consider is there are different speeds of cables as well. So this is a standard cable, which again is perfectly fine for 1080p content. This is a high speed cable, which is really recommended 4K content and above. And my recommendation to you would be always try to find the best HDMI cable you can afford because even if you don't need a high speed HDMI 2.1 cable today, you may want to upgrade the resolution of the content you're sharing or you may want to extend the distance between the transmitter and your media or the receiver and your monitor and having a higher quality cable that's high speed will allow you to do that. So the HDMI portion of it is pretty easy to check but that's the first place I'd look. The next connection that's extremely important is the connection between the two modules, between the transmitter and receiver module. Now, in this case, I'm using a LAN-based system. That LAN cable has standards applied to it as well. It's typically a CAT5e, CAT6, or CAT7. Again, with a CAT5e, perfectly fine for 1080p content, but if you're going to transmit 4K or 8K content, especially over long distances, it's probably going to be a CAT6 or a CAT7 cable. And again, all these cables look very similar. Here I have three cables. This is a CAT5e, this one is a CAT6, and this is a CAT7. Now, depending on, again, the distance and the type of content you're transmitting, you'll want to select these cables. Now, if the cables already run, you don't have a lot of choice over it, but if you're running a new cable, my suggestion would be at a minimum to use a CAT6 or even a CAT7 if you can afford it. It is a little bit more expensive, but it's worth it because, again, if you upgrade the content later on to a higher resolution or you want to extend that secondary location further away, having a CAT7 cable will accommodate both of those situations. At a bare minimum, check the manual because the manual will specify the type of HDMI cable that it expects to use and the LAN connection between the two. So always check the manual and that'll help you avoid some of the problems initially. Another consideration is typically there's a power supply at the transmitter and a power supply at the receiver that need to be plugged in. A lot of times you'll plug that receiver power supply into a power strip at the remote location and maybe even plug this into a power strip at the primary location. The problem with a power strip is that you're sharing that electricity from the wall outlet across anything that's plugged into that power strip. And as you plug more devices in, whether it's a big monitor, a couple of media players, a DVD player, all of those are drawing current out of that power strip. You may not have enough power left to actually supply power to the transmitter or the receiver. So the thing I'd recommend is if you're having problems and you've checked the HDMI cable, you're sure you've got a good LAN connection, if you're plugging something into a power strip, unplug it, plug it directly into a wall outlet to see if that solves your problem. 
The other place you can get into trouble is sometimes the receiver modules run off of a standard USB-A 5 volt uh, voltage. So the, a cable will include a USB-A connection that you can typically plug into your monitor or plug into a wall power supply. A lot of times you have to check the USB-A connection on that monitor to make sure that it can supply enough current to actually power up the module. Typically one amp, one and a half amp or two and a half amps is perfectly fine for that. Another consideration is a thing called EDID, which is Extended Display Identification. Now EDID controls both the resolution and the audio type that's being transmitted across your solution. And you have to make some decisions about, am I transmitting 4K content? Am I transmitting 5.1 or 2.1 surround sound? And the EDID settings have to be set correctly to accommodate that type of content. Again, the manual's your friend in this case because in here it'll explain exactly what the EDID settings are for different audio structures and for different resolutions and frame rates. So make sure you match those two up before you get started because that's another really important consideration. And then the last thing I'll mention, which is something that a lot of people have trouble with, is you need to make sure that whatever media device you want to extend to the secondary location matches up with the monitor you're using over there because there are settings you can make inside the monitor to accommodate 4K versus 1080p, even different resolutions and frame rates like maybe 60 hertz or 30 hertz. You want to make sure that your media device matches up with your display device. And a really basic troubleshooting step you can take if you're having any issues whatsoever is to pick up the display from that secondary location along with the HDMI cable and bring it down to the primary location, plug it directly into the media device that you'd like to share with that secondary location, just to make sure you can display the content here locally before you bring it up to that remote location and start extending that content over an HDMI extender. And that will ensure that you've got the settings right on the monitor, that you've got plenty of power for the remote receiver, and that the cabling you're using is accommodating the type of resolution you'd like to broadcast to that remote location. If that works, then you know at that point the only concern you may have is with power to the receiver and the transmitter module or the LAN connection between them, and those are easy to troubleshoot. So those are the five things that are the most common pitfalls that customers can fall into around an HDMI extension kit. But again, these products are so simple to install. With a few simple connections, you can have these up and running in no time. So hopefully you found this helpful, and until next time, thanks for watching.